yeah, that's problematic. All right, go ahead. But I would say, but I would say the the the, the word they use for bestiality, which is translated perversion or something, it's not the same word either, you know. But still, but still, yeah. So I think if you look at the the cultural context, that's the thing that really convinced me. They had no understanding of same sex attraction. They were trying to pr preserve patriarchal lineage and okay. things like that. And, and all, even when it comes to ancestral relations and things like that, I'm not sure the emphasis was, was the fact that it was morally wrong so much as it just messed up the, yeah. the lineage and the inheritance and things like that. No, you're right. I'm glad you mentioned culture because um, Ann was highlighting the CEB study Bible, the women's Bible which has, um, I think this, is this the one you're reading, Anne, the purple book? No. Oh, that not, one. Oh, interesting. It's not the woman's Bible. No, but it is the same translation. Thank you. So you were reading from the editorial in there. Let me um, read this little book. Um, yeah, this is interesting. This is from the same translation that Anne's talking about, but it's the women's Bible. Cultures express their deep values by, among other things, making rules about who may and may not have sex with whom. For very Western cultures, that's us, the worst sexual offenses involve adults molesting children or raping other adults. I think we can agree on that. Laws against these acts express the culture's revulsion at anyone being forced into sex. Punishment for rape also appears among Old Testament laws. But like the rules of many other traditional cultures, they pay more attention to incest and intermarriage. Their overriding concern involves proper behavior between and within groups so the traditional boundaries don't get confused. Old Testament writers express revulsion at sex between members of groups they do not think belong together. Married women and other men, parent-child relationships, human-animal relationships, same-sex relationships, and also couples from different ethnic or religious groups, and even interbreeding different animal and plant species, which we do all the time now. Jewish and and uh, Christian debates over sexual ethics, therefore, it usually involve disagreements over which is more important, social tradition, individual freedom, or group identity. The psychology of human sexuality has recently influenced these debates too. As a result, political arguments about incest and about homosexuality frequently cite Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20, which we'll get to in a moment, Contemporary nuclear families and pluralistic societies, however, don't resemble ancient Israel's families and societies very much. That's why they rarely try to follow all the laws of Leviticus 18 through 20. Applying these rules to other societies can distort their meaning and harm vulnerable people rather than protect them. Sometimes people have even cited Leviticus 20's harsh punishments to justify violent attacks on others. Religious debates over sexual ethics must instead start with fundamental biblical mandates to love one another and protect the vulnerable. From there, they can work out rules about who can have sex with whom. There you go. Written well, by Scholar. I, I do have that. I just didn't read it. <laughs> That's all right. That's great. So this is, oh, it does say excerpted from the CEV study Bible. That's wonderful. Right, so, and, and this gets back to what you were saying, Anne, on top of everything we were saying, and on top of what David was saying about the cultures are so different, um, you know, there's the, also the, the fact of just, you know, it's primitive compared to today. There was no concept, let alone a vocabulary, for what to do if someone's actually in love with someone of the same gender, because that was just, foreign. that's just a foreign concept to them. Almost as foreign as just talking about love between a straight man and a straight woman. It, it's not as much about love so much yet in scripture to this point as it is about her procreation. So, you know, now we would say, I mean, we should say, although there's still realms of Western society that don't say that sex is for pleasure and intimacy and enjoyment, not just for procreating. And that also unlocks for the LGBT community the fact that you can have and not have to produce children. Um, and that also, I would file in the same category, those who try to have children but cannot. Okay. Under that, under this, these archaic laws, someone who just for no fault of their own cannot have children would be kind of considered an abomination as well, to some extent. Do you see the connection, everybody? And we wouldn't say that today. 
Okay. So there you go. Context is key. I have oh, yeah, a right. question. So in the passage that you just read, it mentions a lot about Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, yeah. So does that, like, is Leviticus kind of similar? Are, are they similar? And so the same kind of what I would call bashing, which is probably not the right word to use, is is happening in that? It, yes, situation? also in Deuteronomy, because Deuteronomy plays out more of the laws. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> but in a more narrative form, not like this. This is mostly like the Lord said, and then we're hearing a lot of instructions. Deuteronomy is a little bit more of a narrative, I think. I think that's right. Mm. Okay. Yeah. It's been a yeah, while. Deuteronomy is the second law. Yep. Oh. Kind of like re re revised, clarified law, exactly. Okay, into all of this, we now go to chapter 19. And um, would someone like to read chapter 19, maybe one, two? Oh, let's go halfway. Oh, it's actually long. Maybe like one to 19. I will. Okay, who's that, okay. Mary? Yeah, this, this is from the women, women's Bible. Um, the Lord said to Moses, say to the whole community of the Israelites, you must be holy because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Each of you must respect your mother and father and you must keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord, your God. Do not turn to idols or make gods of cast metal for yourselves. I am the Lord, your God. When you sacrifice a communal sacrifice of well-being to the Lord, offer it so that it will be accepted on your account. It must be eaten on the day of your sacrifice or the following day. Whatever is left over on the third day must be burned with fire. If any of it is eaten on the third day, it is foul. It will not be accepted. Anyone who eats it will be liable to punishment because they defiled what is holy to the Lord. That person will be cut off from their people. When you harvest your land's produce, you must not harvest all the way to the edge of your field and don't gather up every remaining bit of your, not, your harvest. Also, do not pick your vineyard clean or gather up all the grapes that have fallen there. Leave these items for the poor and immigrant. I am the Lord, your God. I'm sorry, should I go on? Uh, did you say? Yes, please. You must not steal nor deceive nor lie to each other. You must not swear falsely by my name, de desecrating your God's name in doing so. I am the Lord. Why don't you go, can you keep going, Mary, till verse 19? Oh, you got muted. Oh. Mary. I had to cancel some. Um, you must not oppress your neighbors or rob them. Do not withhold a hired laborer's pay overnight. You must not insult a deaf person or put some obstacle in front of a blind person that would cause them to trip. Instead, fear your God. I am the Lord. You must not act unjustly in a legal case. Do not show favoritism to the poor or deference the great. You must judge your fellow Israelites fairly. Do not go around slandering your people. Do not stand by while your neighbor's blood is shed. I am the Lord. You must not hate your fellow Israelites in your heart. Rebuke your fellow Israelites strongly so you don't become responsible for his sin. You must not take revenge nor hold a grudge against any of your people. Instead, you must love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Beautiful. Now, I hope many of you are probably thinking, now that's a little bit more like it. <laughs> um, a kind of a, a revisit of some of the key Ten Commandments, which is always good to remind people. But I love also how, it, how and where it's placed in Leviticus after we just read those troubling passages. Then we come into here um, with things that sound a little bit more like God and less like a Levitical priest trying to get in some of the community norms. Um, and that's, and I'm trying to give them some grace a little bit. Which of these so far have st stuck out to you or what kind of rings truer or not? We have another abomination in here, but it's about eating. I just like the, uh, 
the emphasis on caring for the the underclass, the poor, the immigrant, the fact right. that that they they were commanded by God. This was their law to uh, leave, you know, certain not just to have it just for themselves, but they were to leave some so that the poor and the immigrants could have something on which to live. Yeah. I, that makes you, well, go ahead. That just makes you refer back to Ruth, the book of Ruth, which is one of my favorite Bibles uh, chapters where Ruth went out and she picked, she was an immigrant and she picked, went around and she picked up the outside of Boaz's field to uh, to help her and Naomi eat. So I, I just, just remember that and 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 I, I'm just agreeing with David. That was one of the things that really picked me up was the idea of the, taking care of the poor and the immigrant and and um, not you know turning them away or doing the abominable things that they did in Sodom and Gomorrah. Just just you know these are these are these are to take care of them. It just speaks to me of fairness, you know, don't hold your laborers wage, you know, leave stuff for other people, you know, like, we're all in this together. So take what you need, but give what you also owe to other people. I find it's kind of interesting that it comes right after the commandment not to steal too, because they have a must have a different idea of what stealing is because Today, if you'd go into somebody's field and take even stuff that's fallen off the tree, they might consider you stealing their their harvest. That's right. Some ways we kind of roll backwards a bit. I mean, the, one of the other beautiful things here is there it is just kind of embedded in verse 18. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So again, a, a cautionary tale for Christians to go, um, remember Jesus was quite well aware of his scripture. He was a very, very good Jewish young man and he knew the scriptures by heart almost. And everything he's saying had a context to it already in scripture. He was just kind of illuminating people from some of the things where they were getting bogged down about like you know how to eat shellfish or whatnot. Here he comes in and goes, basically, he didn't say it in so many words, but he's using, he's, he's saying really to my ears, Leviticus or the Torah or the teachings are all saying, love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus is reorienting his community to say, this is the takeaway, not, not um, restrictions. In the message, oh, oh, go ahead. Shibar. Oh, in the message, I was just rereading the passage, and it clearly lays things out much clearer. Like, don't steal, don't lie, don't deceive, don't swear falsely, don't exploit your friend or rob him. I mean, it's much more what I would consider detailed mm -hmm. compared to what's in Leviticus. Yeah. Anyway. No, that's right. I was, gonna, I was gonna say that this part here about loving your neighbor as yourself but you might have to reprove him because you don't want to take on his sins mm -hmm. so i guess you're you're supposed to love him no matter what he's doing uh, right it's hard to say the least that's why uh, when you see these new s stories about someone who's able to for give someone for doing a horrendous crime or act to their family. I, I always pray for that because I think if anybody ever harms my family, I don't know that I truly love them. Right. Um, and so it always amazes me when I see that these, whoever it is, clearly when they say I have forgiven and it's usually a very horrendous thing. So I know I fall short. I know I fall short of being the Christian woman I'm supposed to be because I, I, I don't think I could do that. So I'm always amazed. Right. It's, it's hard. I mean, the ask to love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, it's in our baptismal covenant. 
um, start seeking serving Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself, um, forgiveness. Um, and I'm quick to also say forgiveness does not mean forgetfulness. So it's, it's just about, um, it's really about reconciliation. I think that's kind of, you know, the phrase I like to use the business God is in of, um, I want people to reconcile their differences and, and, you know, that's one of the reasons Jesus does what he does on the cross. It's a, it's a giant reconciliation. Um, that's what that word atonement means. And, um, you know, reconciling means I don't, that doesn't necessarily mean I, I don't understand what you did to me or my family. I don't, I don't condone what you did to me, my family, but I forgive you, you know, but, and that's to, to end the cycle of injustice. That is a hard ask. And only that's why the people that do it, you know, are, are, you know, titans of, <laughs> you know, we're talking about like Nelson Mandela, right? Like um, people that just, Nelson Mandela is one of the great examples who just had the opportunity to persecute everyone who jailed him and he just said, it's not worth it, you know? I mean, say it that way, probably said it more eloquently. Um, and he's not the only one, you know, there's, there's others, but this is why these people, I mean, that's just people rising to the occasion is exactly what God wants, you know, to just say, you can, you're, we're above this. Mm -hmm. We're all in this together. And that's where appealing begins. All right. I think sometimes, I think sometimes it's hard to say, love, love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't even love yourself, right. if you hate yourself, then it's very difficult to reach out and love your neighbor. And I was just thinking about that because I know sometimes it's hard when you go through situations and you've done something wrong and you feel like I could never be forgiven for that particular um, situation and sin or whatever you want to call it. And so then you just, so you can't, you can't reach out to, to your neighbor and love them because they just, you don't, you, you don't love yourself. Yeah. I just think it is that sometimes it's difficult to do that. Um, but I know that, you know, we're, we're supposed to love others and that's the, and that is the main, I think the main gist of Jesus's ministry right. and what, what he wanted to reach out to all of us for, to, to do. Beautifully said. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, can picking up, uh, I'm going to read here from the NRSV. I think we're on verse 19. Maybe that's a repeat. All right. You shall keep my statutes. You shall not let your animals breed with a different kind. Uh-oh, we've slid backwards. <laughs> We're back to this again. So shall not you shall not sow your field with two kinds of seed. You shall not put on a garment made of two different materials. It's getting really specific now. If a man has sexual relations with a woman who is a slave designated for another man, but not ransomed or given her freedom, an inquiry shall be held. They shall not be put to death since she has not been freed. But he shall bring a guilt offering for himself to the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting, a ram as guilt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of guilt offering before the Lord for his sin that he committed. And the sin shall the sin he committed shall be forgiven him. Okay, let me just stop right there. Again, 21st century postmodern Christians in the United States of America. <laughs> What's missing from this whole passage of 20 to 22, which they never, again, it's not what they, you just have to give them a little bit of grace to say they weren't interested in this stuff. We're, we, we are all going, what about this woman who is enslaved, yeah. right? Look, look this, this is a perfect example of how antiquated this is. That's not even a consideration. They're not, nothing is like free the woman. <laughs> how about release the you know this is where jesus probably would step in and said i've got one for you why don't you take take her out of bondage mm -hmm. that all comes later when we realize we're devaluing human beings so it sounds almost hypocritical that they're they're kind of glossing over that and the only thing they're concerned about is how can the man um get ritually clean again from what he's done how, how can he offer up um an offering to god to kind of um make atonement for his sin and the sin is not keeping a woman enslaved. The sin is having sex with a slave. 
Which How come not... there's no mention of a man being enslaved, being sexually abused? I think that's just to show that in, in back in those days, women were just so much more of their possessions. Pretty, yeah. Not, yeah. not so much a person. Sure. Yeah, no, that's what I was going to say is the sin is more damaging the other man's property. Right, right. You know, that he uh, used another man's property without compensation. Right. And so... Yeah. So I think, you know, women don't have agency. And when we were back talking about a man lying with a man, they don't say a woman lying with a woman is a problem. Right. They don't care. Because women aren't their audience. Exactly. <laughs> women right, aren't right, reading right. this, women aren't writing this, women aren't talking about this. So like this is a world devoid of right. female agency and perspective. And if there was a woman then to say, what about women sleeping with women? They would be like, who cares what you think? Right. I mean, that's kind of their, yeah. honestly, that's like yeah. the way they're kind of, Feeling, yeah, it's just, it, and this is just again, context is everything. All right, keep it going. It really is. <laughs> when you come into the land and plant all kinds of trees for food, then you shall regard their fruit as forbidden. Three years it shall be forbidden to you, it must not be eaten. In the fourth year, all their fruit shall be set apart for rejoicing in the Lord. But in the fifth year, you may eat of their fruit, that their yield may be increased for you. I am the Lord. You shall not eat anything with its blood. You shall not practice augury or with witchcraft. You shall not round off the hair on your temples or mar the edges of your beard. It's funny. They never put these on posters at rallies. I don't understand why. You shall not make any gashes in your flesh for the dead or tattoo any marks upon you. Shoot, that's like 60% of the United States. Do not profane your daughter by making her a prostitute that the land not become prostituted and full of depravity. Again, only worried about the land, not worried about the life of this poor child. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Do not turn to mediums or wizards. There's another 30% of society right now. Do not <laughs> be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. No, no um, uh, not sociology, what's the stars? Astrology, can't do astrology. You shall rise before the aged and defer to the old. Okay, there goes 99% of the country now too. And you shall fear your God. When an alien resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the alien. Interesting. Yeah. Also, it doesn't seem to make it into certainly not political discussion. At least not the same ones. <laughs> not the same ones, yeah. Um, and I'm not making fun of scripture per se, as I'm just making fun of how people take scripture out of context. And we've spent a lot of, we've had a long list here of things that people do daily. The alien who resides with you shall be you to you as the citizen among you. You shall love the alien as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. You shall not cheat in measuring length, weight, or quantity. You shall have honest balances, honest weights, an honest epath, and an honest hand. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall keep all my statutes and all my ordinances and observe them. I am the Lord. The, with the exception of a few of these things about women being used as property, and I'm not, I'm not devaluing them at all, the overwhelming majority of chapter 19 is about um, how to, um, like I said, reconcile, how to love your neighbor as yourself. And it tends to add, end up here with the exception of that last verse or two about weight and measures. This final thought is very, very relevant today because it's curiously un, unreferenced or unspoken to when people try to use the Bible to justify um, whatever they think about immigration or say refugees, such as those from Afghanistan or Haiti. Um, this is, if you're looking for scriptural witness and you want to, um, and this is consistent because this is going to be what Jesus speaks about too. If you add up, love your neighbor as yourself and treating um, an alien or, an, or a stranger who resides with you to be the citizen among you and love the neighbor as yourself, seems pretty clear to me. It doesn't, I don't really see how to argue your way out of that one. What do you all think? hard yeah. I no i think, oh, I, was, go ahead. I was gonna say i don't know how people can look at anybody as an immigrant or an alien today when you have to think of the world as being your entire community rather than just your neighborhood you live in right, mm -hmm. right. david what were you gonna say 
Like I was just going to, I was going to, I agree, but there are passages in the Old Testament that aren't quite as welcoming to immigrants, but here it definitely is. So I would, that, that was my question. Where's the wall? You know, <laughs> you know, so uh, it's. And that probably is a result of people, um, societies going on and on and starting to get concerned about things like their, um, I don't know, their safety or, you know, tribes of different skin color, even that was probably all really subtle. Um, that, that awareness of differences and, and being othered, which is really part of the story of Genesis 2 in the garden, you know, of, of Adam and Eve kind of being, uh, being awoken to the fact that they're naked and they're different and that they have shame and guilt and all. And I think that that poetry can be applied here a little bit that um, while this is a commandment of God, it is a really difficult one for people um, when they're when so much of our world is based on fear and, and the unknown. It's hard. Um, I, I, it has been a source of, of consternation to me when I have talked to people who feel uh, very negative about immigrants is that we are all immigrants. We have come here, you know, it's like, okay, um, how do you excerpt yourself, take yourself out of the reality that we are, we have all come here to the United States of America, you know, as immigrants from somewhere back in our families. And I just keep thinking about that. Occasionally I say it, but it just really riles me. <laughs> Absolutely. Manifest destiny. Manifest. That's how to resolve it. Mm -hmm. right. But how did they how did the biblical people even um, justify or or define an alien when the majority of the societies were nomadic? Right. Yeah. How did and they do that? What it's what, a great what, big kind of example of what ha who gets to tell the story. Remember, this is Israel's story. And um, it is a distinctly Jewish story. So there's a, a bit of a telling with the, um, you know, I'm not sure the exact time period this was written, but there's a bit of a, um, the context is that, you know, they have, they have been rescued and it's now centuries since they were saved by God at the Red Sea. And you wonder if they've forgotten a bit of what it was like to be enslaved. Um, and I think you could the, apply that to modern times too, so in some ways, yes. I was, I was just gonna say the anti-immigrant passages that are in the Old Testament are all in the context pretty much of idolatry. It wasn't people as people, or it was just the, the concern about uh, turning Israel or turning the Hebrews against their God. So um, yeah, that, that, that was, uh, that's the context of that. So it's a kind of a different context they're talking about. Yeah. So to, is, them, to them, alien is not from a different geographic area. It's a different belief mindset. Is that what yeah, different deity, I would say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, we're still in a time period where Yahweh is the God of Israel, but there is acknowledgement that there are other gods of other tribes and other, other religions out there. Um, later we come to the Christian understanding that it's, it is all one God. There are no other gods. There is one God, right? Okay. That was chapter 19. Now chapter 20, we, we've turned back to the bedroom uh, in, a, in a second here um, with some other kind of... Um, consequences. Would anyone like to read chapter 20, maybe 1 to 16? I can do that. Okay, Leslie. thanks, Leslie. And um, which, what do you want? I have the NRSB or the CEB? How about CEB? <clears throat> okay. Um, the heading of this is, the worship of Moloch is forbidden. The Lord said to Moses, you will also say to the Israelites, any Israelite or any immigrant living in Israel, who gives their children to Molech, must be executed. The common people will stone such a person. Moreover, I will set my own face against such a person, cutting them off from their people. 
because they gave their children to Moloch, making my sanctuary unclean and degrading my holy name by doing so. But if the common people choose to look the other way when someone gives their children to Moloch and do not execute such a person, I will set my own face against such a person and their extended family, cutting off from their people both the guilty party and anyone with them who faithlessly followed Molech. I will also oppose anyone who resorts to dead spirits or spirits of divination and faithlessly follows those, those things. I will cut such an individual off from their people. You must be holy and keep yourself holy because I am the Lord your God. You will keep my rules and do them. I am the Lord who makes you holy. If anyone curses their father or mother, they must be executed. They have cursed their own father and mother. That person's blood is on their own heads. If a man commits adultery with a married woman, committing adultery with the neighbor's wife, both the adulterer and the adulteress must be executed. If a man has sexual intercourse with his father's wife, has uncovered his father's nakedness, both of them must be executed. Their blood is on their own heads. If a man has sexual intercourse with his daughter-in-law, both of them must be executed. They have acted perversely <clears throat> with the woman. The two of them have done something detestable. They must be executed. There will be, they will be burned with fire, the man and the two women, so that no such shameful thing will be found among you. If a man has sexual relations with an animal, he must be executed and you must kill the animal. If a woman approaches any kind of animal to mate with it, you must kill the woman and the animal. They must be executed. Their blood is on their own heads. If a man marries his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and they have sexual contact with each other, it is a disgrace. They will be cut off in the sight of their people. Such a man has, such a man has had sexual contact with his sister. He will be liable to punishment. If a man sleeps with a woman during her menstrual period and has sexual contact with her, he has exposed the source of the blood, her blood flow, and has an uncovered the same. Both of them will be cut off from their people. You must not have sexual contact with your mother's sister or your father's sister because that exposes their own close relative. Both of you will be liable to punishment. If a man has sexual intercourse with his aunt, he has uncovered his na uncle's na nakedness. His brother's wife, it is indecent. He has uncovered his brother's nakedness. The man and the woman will be childless. Why don't you go ahead and finish the chapter, Leslie? Okay, yeah, there's not much left. <laughs> you must keep all my rules and all my regulations and do them so that the land I am bringing you to, where you will live, you won't vomit you out. You must not follow the practices of the nations that I am throwing out before you because they did all these things and I was disgusted with them. But I have told you, you will certainly possess their fertile land. I am giving it to you to possess. It is a land full of milk and honey. I am the Lord your God who has separated you from all other peoples. So you must separate between clean and unclean animals and be clean and unclean birds. Do not become detestable through some, wait a minute. Do not become, do not become detestable through some animal bird or anything that moves on the fertile ground that I have separated from you as unclean. You must be holy to me because the Lord, because I, the Lord, am holy and I have separated you from all other peoples to be my own. If someone, whether male or female, is a medium with the dead or div diviner, you must be executed. They will be stoned. Their blood is on their own head. Thank you. Yeah. Harsh. What was their definition? What was their distinction between a medium and a prophet? 
I think uh, it's a good question. My guess would be a medium, um, a prophet shares what God is saying um, to the people and a prophet usually interprets this to a king or ruler. I think a medium speaks to the dead, but I'm not 100% sure that that's the, the, that, that might be a modern interpretation. Was Moloch a, a big god? Yeah, I was trying to look up Moloch. There's yeah, not much about Moloch. Um, it, it's a variation on, the, on um, you know, we heard this name on Sunday, uh, Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I, and we had that, fun with the... Is that a derivation of it's, Moloch? It's kind of, they both mean king, and it, it's wonders, it, you wonder if it's a little bit, um, if it, or ruler, that it might mean... Um, uh, somebody that is uh, not exactly real, but like a kind of a personification of a bunch of different characters, you know, kind of, I hate to say made up, but that's mm -hmm. kind of what Melchizedek is too. Um, and I'm looking at uh, Holy Imagination by Judy Fenders Williams, who talks about Leviticus 2010, if a man commits adultery with a married woman, committing adultery with a neighbor's wife, both the adulterer and the adulteress must be executed. And she is pointing out too, again, some of the questions we come to this scripture asking are not the questions that Israel was asking when they composed this. Here, the issue is not whether adultery is an offense or not. It is concerned with the severity of the punishment, particularly when we consider the adulteress may have been forced or raped by the adulterer. Yeah. Find a dialogue with other ancient Near Eastern laws broaden our understanding. And the editors of Leviticus are taking the concerns for government and community shared by their tribal neighbors and casting them differently to eliminate the role and centrality of the king. There's an interesting, this is also from Judy, uh, an interesting background for the account of Jesus's handling of a woman caught in adultery in John 8. That's the kind of famous passage where they're about to stone her and where religious leaders are ready to carry out the punishment, which is prescribed from the law, like here in Leviticus, and it is Jesus who shows mercy. And again, another example of Jesus acting as the great interpreter of the scriptures and while they say the law may say this, Jesus may say the law also says, love your neighbor as yourself. And that is another one of these, I think, macro takeaways from these three chapters here is you have chapter 18 and you have chapter 20, and they both have problematic things about women and about um, the queer community. And yet in the middle of them is chapter 19, which itself is a little complicated, but is reminding us and kind of revisiting the points of all of this, which is the commandments and, and, and embedded in there, one that is not in the top 10 of the 10 commandments, I guess it's in commandment number 11, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And if you think of it kind of like a mountain, like you've kind of got 18 and then you go up to 20 and then, I mean, sorry, 18 up to 19 and then 20 back down, everything is said in the context of this um, commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. And it's, and it's really a question of who's right and who's wrong and which, which scripture are you going to take out of context? And, you know, how are you going to hold and carry all of this? So it's a, it's a pickle, but it's, it's a, it's, I think the most important thing we can say is it's so dangerous to, to take it out of its context. So dangerous. Yes, Anne. Um, you know, I, for the EFM class, we're reading the Hebrew Bible interpreted by women. And oh. um, not, not like the whole Bible, but there are women that are, you know, taking passages and um, re-examining it. And it made me think that um, when we read the Bible, uh, not only we're reading about a patriarch patriarchal society, but the early men who interpreted the Bible were also from a patriarchal society. So perhaps they got it wrong. Right, right. <laughs> Maybe some of the really, the things that we cannot reconcile with, whether it be about women or slaves or whatever, um, maybe they didn't, get, they didn't get it right. But it's just been held for generations because it was interpreted by 
like 1% of the society that were white male patriarchs. Exactly. I mean, even, even though, you know, in the, in the grand scheme of modern, not even modern, all history, how, how small a sliver of time has been given only in recent times and years, we can count them in, on, our, on our hand almost, a time where women and, and other marginalized groups in society have felt even they can even approach scripture and be able to ask questions, you know. And for some realms of Christianity, you're not allowed to ask these questions still. It's amazing. Or other faiths. Judaism's come a far, a long way. You know, they tend to invite the, the debate and the discussion. Um, and I think sometimes Christians, particularly Western Christians, are more comfortable being told what to think. Um, it's my, that's the that part where I kind of feel um, depressed. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, and David and Leslie, that's kind of your experience. I know we revisit that a lot, but you're, you know, it, and it swings on, it's not a circle. It really is kind of a spectrum, but there's on one end Catholicism and the other end fundamentalist or evangelical and they both try to they both have a patriarchy that tells you what to think and that's really comforting for some people that can't deal with the ambiguity and the discrepancies and the and the gray so to speak yeah yeah the catholic authority comes more from their tradition the magisterium whereas the evangelical authority of course comes from a literal kind of translation or understanding or, the, or hermeneutic of the bible and even though our particular uh, branch of evangelicalism was did have women ordained and allowed women to preach in a practical level, it it, it wasn't the same, you know. It's a, and it's it's just the effect of society around us. And as you said, when you figure it's less than a hundred years that women have had any kind of Im impact in, in in the majority of societies, there were matriarchal societies, but they were small and few between and and they didn't have any impact on the biblical record. Yeah, yeah. Well, any other final thoughts, anybody, for today? It's good, good getting down in the dirt and digging with you. Um, let me give a little plug for the Praxis course. Tomorrow it starts tomorrow night. Um, if you're coming in person, um, uh, Anna and Barb are graciously hosting the meal. Um, but do let us know if you're coming in person, and um, if you haven't already. And then um, you can also zoom in and participate that way too. And there will be ample time for conversation, much like we have here in Bible study um, about the topics we're discussing. And I've been a little quiet on the the kind of what the topics are, but it's basically a um, you'll hear me begin talking about we're kind of building a case for our belief. So we start with um, how do we know God exists, and then each a little bit more specific um, down to how Episcopalians have kind of come to understand all of these things. So should be fun. All right. See you all then or there next week. Bye, Take care. Bye. Great day. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.